APUS government students, we are getting to the home stretch. We have this lecture and one more, and that is it in terms of lectures for this semester. So we're there. We're close. We're getting our way through uh, this year in the next few days. We're going to review, and we're going to get your last exam done this week and that way we can prepare for a few other things that we want to do next week and your final coming up coming up soon so we'll be talking more about that in the coming days and weeks as well so as you prepare yourself for this we're going to begin to look at elections and different election types all right so you can see there primaries and caucuses Getting to the right page here for you. So we're on page 134. So a number of things to get down here. So we're on that, that left-hand side there. The main thing that we have to recognize is that there's two types of ways in which a state can help to choose their nominee. And states, even within the states, their parties can help to choose the nominee. All right? So parties are free to do what they want to do. And even the parties across our nation kind of allow the state parties to kind of choose how they want to choose or preference, I guess is the word we should look for, preference their candidate for the general election. Who should the nominee be? And Nebraska Republicans, you can see there, have done the traditional, and when I say primary, I want you to think about, you know, old school ballot, you know, the way in which a lot of places do this uh, is with that ballot. So closed primary. So primary with a ballot, closed. What does that mean? It means that it's only open to party members. So if I'm a Democrat... I can't vote in the Nebraska Republican primary. And if you think about it, it makes it makes sense. I mean, you don't want Democrats in there voting for who the nominee should be on the opposite side uh, of them. You want you want Republicans to choose that nominee. Now, a state can choose to be open, and Nebraska has chosen to be open on the Democratic side. So the Nebraska Democratic Party has chosen to be an open primary state. So again, ballot voting. However, in this case, they open it up to independents as well. And if you think about it, the, the Democratic Party in Nebraska, certainly second fiddle to Republicans, outnumbered. Um, in lots of parts of our state and overall in our state by a, by a large number. So that idea Democrats have to open it up to independents to get them involved in their process is something that you can see that they try to do. All right, so Nebraska Republicans closed. Nebraska Democrats open, meaning that it's open to independents and Democrats. All right, and you can see closed versus open. Now, caucuses are rare. But a few states choose to do them, most notably Iowa next door to us. They choose to do a caucus. The issue with caucuses is this. They don't really vote by ballot. They'll meet at a school or a church or, or some neighborhood place uh, that's set up by their party. And they will have to meet at a specific time to then go there and discuss. And then it's kind of very informal. They can raise their hands. They can go to a different part of a gym if it's at a school. So it's kind of a stand and be counted meeting of votes. All right. So the downfall with the caucus is that you only get a vote at a specific time. You got to be there versus a primary may, may be open for 12 or 13 hours during, during the day. All right. So though the caucus is more interactive, it's rarer. All right, so let's move on to the right-hand side there. I went a little bit long. The, the general election then. So obviously the, the states all across our country in the spring of that election year, just as we saw, 
they're going to have the opportunity to choose the nominee. We saw Donald Trump was pretty much a no-brainer on the Republican side. We saw early on in the spring that the Democratic Party got behind Joe Biden. We'll talk more about that here and maybe why in a second. And uh, the nominees then meet in the general election. So that's the election that we just had, the general election, of which, as we you saw with my ballot, there's a senator on there. The House of Representative folks are on there. Uh, there may be an initiative, just like we had gambling on there. There may be local school board elections, all sorts of things. The one thing to talk about here is the coattail effect. All right, so the most popular example in your lifetime that I give to this is that the first state to have recreational marijuana was Colorado. And they timed it perfectly in 2008. There was a candidate up for president. We know Barack Obama. He was dynamic among young people. He was dynamic among liberals. And those were the two groups that were going to bring recreational pot to Colorado. Young people, more liberal people. So as people were showing up to vote for Barack Obama, it was, hey, I can vote for pot too. So they had this coattail effect where people may be showing up for one thing, but they also get a vote and ride the coattails so to speak, of something else, of something else. Okay, so that is the coattail effect. All right, let's take a look then now, down at the bottom of page 134. Typically, presidential candidates impl uh, implement their campaign strategies. B. And we'll talk about that here in a second. B for that one. All right, let's flip to page 135. Which of the following best is best represented by the graph above? Oh, I think you'll see that in your on your test. You can see that voter turnout certainly depends upon the election. Yeah, D. All right, now let's take a look at the bottom of page 135. Electoral College, let's revisit this. So, only the presidential race utilizes the Electoral College. It's in the Constitution. Any desires to change that you may not like about the Electoral College, it's going to be difficult because it's going to take our Congress, a good portion of them, two-thirds of them, and then three-fourths of the states to support that, so 38 states. So we're in the process of seeing that the Electoral College in the coming days and weeks is going to be formally electing the president. Why did America vote? America voted to direct how their electoral votes in their state should be cast. And as I think we know, each state is given a number of electoral votes. It's equal to the number of people that they send to Congress. All right, so Nebraska has five people that are pledged to vote. As Nebraska has told them to vote, the governor appoints them, but we have five of them. And they will formally go and cast our electoral ballots. Now, we know we're a little bit different. We saw that 48 states, all of their electoral votes, all of their people representing those electoral votes are going to go vote for the same candidate because they're winner-take-all states. Because they're winner-take-all states. Now, as you saw in Nebraska, we do ours differently. We've chosen to do this since the early 1990s. Whoever wins in the overall state, our entire state gets two, not all, just two. That was Donald Trump. And then based upon our congressional districts, and this is where, as I think about this, gerrymandering really comes into play here when it comes to these electoral votes. And that's why a lot more states don't do this is because that makes gerrymandering that much more important when you divide them up the way Nebraska does. Whoever wins in each of our three districts then gets 
one additional electoral vote. So Donald Trump took two for winning the overall state. He won in districts one and three. Joe Biden won in our district, district two. So he took one and our president four. 538 total electoral votes, 270 to win. It's not who gets the most, it's who gets the majority, 270. If no candidate reaches that, the House of Representatives meets to decide. Some criticisms of the college. Winner-take-all system. It can exaggerate the margin of victory. Take a look at the 2016 election there at the top. Donald Trump won handily in the Electoral College. Look at that, 306, but then lost by over a million votes in the popular vote, but yet that doesn't matter. Seemingly, and you saw this, only battleground states matter. Our candidates in 2020 spent about 80 to 90 percent of their time in about six or seven states. And then number three, it's happened twice. You can lose a majority of the popular vote. It's happened twice in your lifetime. Well, it's happened twice in my lifetime. Sorry, you guys weren't born in 2000. It's happened once in your lifetime where you can lose the popular vote yet still win the Electoral College. Let's take a look here at what happened in 2020. So top left there, you can see the success of Donald Trump. So you can take a look at all those states there in red that he won. What changed? What changed in 2020? Well, I think as we look back upon it, we had a historic turnout. And again, there's nothing for you guys to write down here. We're just talking here. Historic turnout. 30 million more voters came out. Trump did very well. Trump did very well. 10 million more people voted for our president. However, on the Democratic side, they had a huge swell of people. 20 million more voters came out for Joe Biden, then came out for Hillary in 2016, and that became the difference. That became the difference. 20 million more Americans came out. So some key flips for Joe Biden, Arizona, kind of a surprise, the Hispanic vote. Georgia and Pennsylvania, seemingly African Americans, came out in droves for Joe Biden. That's been a classic group of people that's voted Democrat and Joe Biden, maybe with his vice presidential running mate, really energized African Americans. And then Michigan, kind of a tough one to tell. Uh, you know, urban voters really came out for Joe Biden. That may have been the difference in Michigan. Changing America. All right, take a look at this real quick. We're seeing a diversification of our country, particularly among Hispanics. You can see they've doubled in size. African Americans, kind of a steady group. Asian Americans, a growing group as well. And you can see how... The amount of whites in our country has declined by about 10%. So it's how can our candidates identify with those groups of people? All right. All right. Again, nothing to, to, to write down here, but um, this is going to be important. This will be the last thing that we'll talk about for today. And then you guys can take a look at the Electoral College scenarios on page 267. I want you to maybe take a picture of this slide and Mr. Wood can pause it here at the end. This is going to be important for your free response because you're going to be given the state of Jefferson. And it's going to be a state where it's going to have different demographics and different groups of people. And I want you to be able to identify and talk to me about the different groups of people that tend to identify with the Democrats versus the Republicans in 2020. So you can see them there. That shouldn't surprise you. The Latino vote is really kind of interesting, as we've talked about. It seemingly like Cuban Americans voted for Trump, whereas Mexican Americans, to a certain extent, and other groups outside of Cuba tended to vote for Joe Biden, kind of, in some areas. So I want you to make sure that you get this down. You take a look at this. And um, yeah, didn't get as far as I wanted, but you guys can work on page 137.